these three missionaries, Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, it says at the beginning of verse 1, these three missionaries had planted a church in the city of Thessalonica, a city that today is still there in Greece. And it was a miracle that this church ever uh, took root. If, if a church can be compared to a plant, a church plant, it's a miracle this plant had ever taken root, much less grown. The, then these missionaries, after they had been absent for some while, they got news that this, this church was being hammered. It was being hammered by from the outside uh, by persecution, and it was being sabotaged from the inside by some bizarre teaching about the second coming of Christ. They were being physically persecuted and undermined uh, by teaching that took their hope off of Christ or that weakened that hope that they had in Christ. Bad end times teaching will do that. And the missionaries, as they got that report, as they heard what was going on in Thessalonica, they were concerned that this church might stop growing, that it, it might stagnate, that it might wilt. If it's a plant, it, that it might wilt, that it might start to wither. You know, Christians can wither. Maybe I don't need to tell you that. Christians can stagnate. Stagnant ponds, you know, where, where the water is just too still for too long. We had ponds in our backyard when I was a child, and and there was also a place nearby where there was a stagnant pond, and I, I remember the, the, the shocking difference. Both of them were so similar. A pool of water here and a pool of water there. But one was alive and the other one was not. Stagnant ponds grow scum on the surface. Stagnant ponds start to smell. I wonder if that describes your spiritual life. Where the water is just still too long. Where some scum has formed on the surface. Where it no longer smells alive and fresh, but stale and lifeless. Is your faith stagnant while you sit at home these days? If Paul and Silvanus and Timothy, uh, who jointly wrote this letter of 2 Thessalonians, if, if they were to spend the last week with you in lockdown in your own home, would what they observe in your life cause them to become worried for you as well as they were for this church? A couple weeks ago, you know, when I heard on the, on the morning news, Prime Minister Trudeau, give an announcement uh, that this lockdown, this stay-at-home order will continue for a long time. I was so deflated. I was It just took the wind right out of me. It was discouraging. And this church in, Th- in Thessalonica, this church had been deflated too by, by some bad end times teaching that sort of took the wind out of their sails. When, when that happens to us, we can coast along only so far before we lose momentum, before we lose vitality, before the reason why we get up in the morning and why we go to church at all and why we pray at all and why we would ever bother to read God's Word at all, before all that momentum begins to die away and we just come to a standstill. We stagnate. But Paul and company... Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, they begin this letter by pointing us to where hope begins. Hope starts with God. And in the opening verses here, it's really just the the introduction, the opening of a letter. But in these opening verses, they begin by reminding us that the way God assembles and cares for and grows his children, even through upheaval, It shows us that we are his and that he is ours. And I hope that this sermon this morning on these first few verses of 2 Thessalonians, that this sermon will remind you to not not to gauge God's love uh, by how big our troubles are, how big our hardship is. 
but rather the other way around. That we would remember to, to look and evaluate and gauge our hardship in light of God's love, how he has loved us, how he has been gracious to us, what he has done for us. The first point I want to make, it comes from the very first verse in 2 Thessalonians, God assembles his children. My key theme, my theme for this passage, as I already said, was that the way God assembles, cares for, and grows his children through upheaval, it shows, it becomes so obvious to us and to others that we are his and he is ours. And so my first point this morning comes from that theme, God assembles his children, and we can see that in verse 1. Look at verse 1 again with me. Paul Silvanus and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians in God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. To the church of the Thessalonians. Uh, what is the church made of? The, it's, this church here was made of Thessalonians. It was the church of the Thessalonians. Not only for the Thessalonians, but of the Thessalonians. Thessalonians, the, the people living in that city, Thessalonica, in Greece at that time. And we know from Acts chapter 17 that many of these people were Jewish converts to Christ, who saw Christ as the Messiah promised in the Hebrew Scriptures and put their faith in him. And we also know uh, from what happened in Acts 17 that Paul then and Timothy and Silvanus turned their ministry when most of the Jews in the synagogue rejected the gospel, they turned their ministry also to the Gentiles. And so we believe and we understand that in Thessalonica, in this church, there were Jews and Gentiles worshiping together. Jews and Gentiles had come together and been formed into a church, a brand new church at this time. Now, what is a church? A church is a, a, a word in English, it, it, when it's translated, the, the word church in the Bible, especially in the New Testament, uh, ha, has the basic meaning of, of to call people together, to call people together. A little while ago, the BC government, like most governments around the world, issued orders restricting the size of groups that can get together. We can only, uh, here at that time, we were only allowed to gather in groups smaller than 50. I don't even know if that's the case today. But another word to, for gathering together is to congregate, where we get the word congregation from, or to assemble. And that's the word uh, that church, uh, that's the word translated church throughout the New Testament, is a, an assembly, a people called together. And the, the idea there being very clear that the idea is that somebody is doing the calling and that people are doing the hearing and they gather together, they congregate, they assemble in response to the word, to the call that they hear. So the word in Greek is ekklesia, to be called out, to be called together. It's not a building. A church is not a building. A church is an assembled congregation, literally a gathering of people. And here we see in verse 1, Paul and Silvanus and Timothy say, to the church of the Thessalonians, and their church has its existence in God, our, in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. In God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. In we have our existence in God. This church existed because they were in God, and not just in God the Father, but also in God the Son, in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This lifts up Jesus to be equal with God, as Andrew was teaching us this morning, and as Adam taught us last week. This lifts up Jesus to be the object of our worship and hope. He is Lord. He is exalted. He is glorified along with his Father, and a church, a true assembly of people called out by the word of God and congregated together is a church that has its existence, its life in God our Father. Verse 1, in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord assembles his church. A church is therefore a supernatural thing. A supernatural assembly as God's voice calls and people hear and congregate. 
The church is a supernatural thing. He does it as our Father, bringing us into relationship with him as his children. And he does it under the Lordship of Jesus Christ, at the church of the Thessalonians in God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. We are under his Lordship, committed to be obedient to him. And the Lord always assembles his church, always through the speaking of his word to his people. You know, the very first church was scary. Nobody wanted to go to church. It was frightening to them. They were afraid. God assembled his people, and they were terrified of what that would mean for them. God assembled his people, and he spoke from the beginning of the Old Testament church. In Exodus 19, verses 9 and following, we see that picture of the very first church God had assembled by his word. In Exodus 9, verse 9, we read, And the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I am coming to you in a thick cloud, that the people may hear when I speak with you, and may also believe you forever. And then in verse 10, it says, The Lord said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow, and let them wash their garments, and be ready for the third day. For on the third day the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. And then we read again down in verse 13 in the second half of the verse, When the trumpet sounds a long blast, they shall come up to the mountain. So Moses went down from the mountain to the people and consecrated the people, and they washed their garments. And then down to verse 16, On the morning of the third day there were thunders and lightnings and a thick thick cloud on the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast, so that all the people in the camp trembled. Then Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God, and they took their stand at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord had descended on it in fire. The smoke of it went up like the smoke of a kiln, and the whole mountain trembled greatly. And as the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him in thunder. The Lord came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain, and the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. And then we read in chapter 20, In verse 18 and 19, right after the giving of the Ten Commandments. Now when all the people saw the thunder and the flashes of lightning and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, the people were afraid and trembled and they stood far off. And they said to Moses, you speak to us and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us lest we die. Moses said to the people, do not fear. For God has come to test you, that the fear of him may be before you, that you might not sin. The people stood far off while Moses drew near to the thick darkness where God was. And then finally we read in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 18, beginning in verse 15, that God said to Moses, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet, rather God says through Moses, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you. From your brothers, it is to him you shall listen. Just as you desired that the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly, when you said, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, or see this great fire any more, lest I die. And the Lord said to me, They are right in what they have spoken. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. And whoever will not... Listen to my words that he shall speak in my name. I myself will require it of him. But the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name that I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that same prophet shall die. And if you say in your heart, how may we know the word that the Lord has spoken? When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, If the word does not come to pass or come true, that is a word that the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You need not be afraid of him. God has been assembling his people ever since to hear his word, 
to receive his promises, but he has been doing it through prophets, through men called to that office of speaking the very words of God. When all the people could no longer gather together as a nation, they began to hold local congregations called synagogues, get-togethers. And in the New Testament, when Jesus, the truest prophet of them all, the one who is the living word of God himself, when he came, he began to apply that word assembly, that word church, to his followers. A new people gathered together, assembled by the voice of God to hear his word and receive life through his word. Now, preachers today are not prophets, but preachers are called to speak the words of the prophets that God gave to the prophets and God gave to the apostles. Preachers are called to speak these words and none other, to teach what God has spoken to his people, to his assembly today. The preachers are not prophets, but the assembly is the same. We are still gathered to hear the words of the living God and to tremble beneath him. There is nothing, there is nothing uh, more contrary to the Bible. There is nothing so opposite to Christianity as Christians who don't gather together when they can to hear the word of the Lord. And I hope this morning that you take that to heart. Maybe you're tuning in to church on the internet. Uh, Maybe you don't normally go to church. But maybe you consider yourself a Christian. You need to change that habit. You need to, as soon as we can, begin assembling together physically with the people of God to hear the word of the Lord. And during this time, we assemble in the best way we can. We assemble from our own homes virtually, as Dr. Bonnie Henry keeps saying. And we do it because we are commanded to gather. We are commanded to congregate as we can in the best way possible, under the word of the Lord. You know, the story of the assembly of the Thessalonians in Acts chapter 17, when Paul and Silvanus and Timothy first planted this church, this assembly, in Acts chapter 17 and verses 1 to 14, Paul went into the local synagogue, to the local Jewish get-together place, meeting place. Synagogue literally means something like get-together. And as as Paul went into that place of worship, he began to teach them and to speak to them from the Scripture. He did that for three weekends, three Sabbath, uh, Sabbath days in that synagogue, and a few more weeks after that among the Gentiles of that city. But all in all, maybe two months or something like that, when Paul and Silvanus and Timothy, these missionaries, were there in Thessalonica to plant that church, to, to teach the gospel, to teach the people. And a church was born miraculously, in such a short time, just a couple of months, a church was planted, a couple of months old uh, at best, when Paul was driven out of that city. The Jews had become hostile. The city government took their side. And First Thessalonians was written, the, the first letter of Paul to the Thessalonians was written to help that church stand, even though it was so young to help it stand and help the plant sort of take root in the midst of the very worst circumstances. And then they heard these missionaries began hearing reports that the persecutions were not only continuing, the persecutions were were causing great affliction in the life of the church. The church was also shaken by this bad end times teaching, which we'll look at in a couple of weeks. And the church needed help before they lost their hope. See, hope begins with God. God had assembled them in him and in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is our head, the head of every local assembly, of every local church. Jesus must be our Lord. Jesus, the Lord, it says in verse 1, exalted, divine, ruler, omnipotent, equal with God the Father. God assembles his children. It is a profound and supernatural thing when we are called together by the word of the living God. And next, Paul and his fellow missionaries, Paul and company, will show that God still speaks his word to his children, to the children he has assembled. Look with me at verse 2, where we see God still cares for his children. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. 
I said at the beginning that my theme is that God, the way that God assembles and cares for and grows his children through upheaval shows that we are his and that he is ours. And this point here, we see that God not only assembles his children, he still cares for his children. He loves his children and he loves us by speaking to us. Grace to you and peace, verse 2 says, from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, Paul wrote this at the beginning of a letter, a letter from God through his apostle to this assembly of saints in Thessalonica. This is God caring for his church. God cares so much that he speaks. What is scripture? But God speaking to his children. Paul says uh, to, to Timothy in a letter that he wrote personally to Timothy in 2 Timothy um, chapter 2, chapter 3. Let me find my place. He says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14, But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Paul wrote this to Timothy to say, Keep on paying attention to what God has written, literally the scriptures, because they are powerful to plant you. They are powerful to assemble you. They are powerful to show God's love for you and to give you life. But Peter also acknowledged in his letter, his second letter, that the writings of Paul were scripture, as all scripture in the Old Testament and New Testament is from God. So Peter is saying even many of Paul's writings were from God as scripture. As Peter says in 2 Timothy 3, 15 and 16. He says, Count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him, as he does in all his letters when he speaks in them of these matters. There are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. You see, it matters that God has spoken to his children. The writings that we have in the Bible are God's word to his children, to assemble his children, to care for his children, to communicate to his children so that they can live under his lordship and in his fatherhood. And Paul even knew this when he wrote the letter of 2 Thessalonians, that as he wrote, his writing bore God's authority, bore the weight of the Lord behind his words. 2 Thessalonians 2, 14, Paul writes, To this he called you through our gospel, so that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brothers, stand firm and hold to the traditions that you were taught by us, either by our spoken word or by our letter. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. You see, it is the letters of the apostles. It is the, the, letter, the books of the prophets. It is the writings of the scriptures, the word of God that makes us able to have hope, that gives us comfort in our hearts, gives us grace to believe in our Savior, and gives us the strength to stand and do good works as we obey the Lord, who is our King and Father. Paul says, grace to you and peace in verse 2. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This letter is like a channel of grace and peace flowing from God to his children assembled by his word in the city of Thessalonica. Grace to you and peace running through this letter like a through water through a pipe, giving nourishment and life to his children. 
grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, I planted some potatoes in our backyard as this pandemic was beginning. And I'm, I'm worried that they aren't growing. I've been so tempted to dig them up and see if there's any signs of life. And uh, yeah, you can tell just from that confession that I'm not much of a gardener and certainly not a farmer. Maybe the potatoes aren't growing yet because it's too early. I don't, I don't really know enough to know that. Maybe the potatoes aren't growing yet because I planted them right under the shadow of a fence and under the shadow of a tree. I don't know much about gardening or farming, but I do know, I do know this. I've heard this before that plants need light. You are saved by grace if you are a Christian. You are saved by grace, but you never stop needing that grace from God. No more than a plant stops needing light once it's planted. The Old Testament calls grace loving kindness, the Hebrew word hesed. Without it, we think God is not good. Without hesed, without remembering and being being uh, lit up, being illuminated by his loving kindness, without God's loving kindness filling our eyes and opening our minds, then we will begin to think God is not good and God is not loving. And we will begin to grow cold to him. We will shrivel up like a plant, like a, a little tiny potato in the dirt that's got no life in it. We will shrivel up with no sunlight. Grace is light. The loving kindness of God to know his love, to be, to, to experience his love, to be reassured of his affection and steadfast love in the scriptures is life giving. Grace to you and peace, Paul said in verse two. From God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, grace is light and peace is to live in the light of God's love. In Job chapter 10, verse 12, Job says, You have granted me life and steadfast love and your care has preserved my spirit. In Psalm 119, verse 88, it says, In your steadfast love give me life that I may keep the testimonies of your mouth. Forever, O Lord, your word is firmly fixed in the heavens. Your faithfulness endures to all generations. You have established the earth, and it stands fast. By your appointment they stand this day, for all things are your servants. If your law had not been my delight, I would have perished in my affliction. I will never forget your precepts, for by them you have given me life. Psalm, Psalm 119, 88 to 93. And in Acts chapter 5, verse 20, when the apostles were released from prison, the angel who released them spoke to them, commanded them, and said, this was from an angel, go and stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. The word of God is life-giving to his people. Why would you not heed it? Why would you not listen more? Why would you not bend yourself and all of your energies to knowing the scripture that gives life to God's people? In Luke, sorry, in John chapter 6, verse 63, Jesus said to the apostles, It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life, but there are some of you who do not believe. You need to listen to God's voice more. That doesn't mean you imagine him talking to you, try to, try to hear some kind of mystical way, some sort of inner voice, and imagine that it might be God's voice speaking to you. If that's where you get your spiritual insight from, I'm worried that the voice you're listening to is not the voice of the Lord. He has already spoken in the Scriptures he has spoken through his prophets, finally through his son and the apostles of Christ. And their words are preserved for us in the Bible that we hold in our hands. He has already spoken. And those words are here for you and me to attend to, to heed and listen. To give life and grace to God's children. That this life and grace and peace flows 
through his writings, through the scriptures, like water through this pipe. Channels of grace and peace, says verse 2. Now, one way that you can listen better to God's word is to prepare yourself to hear his word every Sunday. Some, some ways that you might do that, perhaps if, if you've got kids at home, when, when we send out the, the weekly sermon text ahead of time before, the, before Sunday comes, maybe gather your children together and turn to that passage in Scripture and read that passage aloud to your children. Let them ask questions about it. See if together you can spot what's the main idea in that passage. What is the pastor going to preach on on Sunday? And pray that God would begin speaking to you through that passage now. You could take your kids and you could open up perhaps an ESV study Bible and you could look to see where is Thessalonica? Where is this city that this letter was written to? Where is it and what was the culture then? And the ESV study Bible, every, the beginning of every book of the Bible, has a wonderful introduction to the background of that city or that place and that writing of that book. You know, you could, you could, as a family, you could gather together during the week at some point and you could pray for the sermon that coming Sunday as, as the pastor be, uh, t- attempts to, does his best to speak the words of the Lord from the scripture. And you could pray that God would make that, that sermon effective, not only for you, but for others who hear. And imagine how your kids would be impacted by that week after week and year after year as they grow to see that their mom and dad were so committed to hearing the word of the Lord that they treated the the ramp up to Sunday as a sacred preparation. Grown-ups, you might get yourself a a commentary series to help you dive a little deeper into the scripture. I highly recommend the commentary series by InterVarsity Press called The Bible Speaks Today. You could get yourself a study Bible like the ESV Study Bible. You could pray for Sunday before it comes. You could follow through with what you hear on the Sunday sermon, and you could, after church, you could phone a friend right now when we're able to get together again physically. You could just get together for lunch, and you could pray about what you heard in the sermon and discuss what you heard in the sermon together. You could follow through and obey what God says to you and how he convicts you in the Scripture. And you could encourage each other to do the same. There are many ways, and I'm just coming up with a couple of ideas. There are many ways you could prepare to listen better to the word of the Lord and prepare yourself for the sacredness of that moment when God speaks to his assembly. Why does this matter? Because this is the way that God has ordained grace and peace flows to us through his scripture, through his writings. God assembles his children, and he cares for his children, and he speaks to them a word of grace and peace. Maybe you believe the Bible's testimony that God created the universe by speaking a word. But have you ever thought about what he accomplishes when his word is given in love to his assembled children, to his church? There is no less power in the word of God that is preached to his assembled churches than there is in the word of God that brought the universe into existence. We believe the scriptures are the word of the living God, do we not? I think many of us, myself included, need to do a gut check to check ourselves to see whether we have really been giving God the credit that he deserves for speaking and acknowledging that the word he speaks is his word, and bowing down to the authority of his voice. Well, thirdly, God grows his children. God assembles his children. God cares for his children by speaking grace and peace to them, and God grows his children. You see, in Thessalonica, when when persecution and affliction couldn't stop That church from growing couldn't stop the roots from growing deeper, couldn't stop the flower from growing higher. When their faith and love wouldn't stop growing, even in such difficult circumstances, doesn't it show that God was still doing a miracle? That God was still in the business of planting supernatural assemblies? 
that God was still working? Or do we just imagine all that? In verse 3, Paul says, We ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, as is right, because your faith is growing abundantly, and the love of every one of you for one another is increasing. Therefore, we ourselves boast about you in the churches of God for your steadfastness and faith in all your persecutions and in the afflictions that you are enduring. We ought, said Paul in verse 3, we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers. And, and you know, I, I, I do know there are, there are some atheists, not all atheists are like this, but there are some atheists who seem to have an axe to grind. There are some atheists who seem angry that God always gets the credit for good and gets none of the blame for the bad. And I can imagine Paul replying to that kind of axe-grinding atheist, that kind of atheist with an attitude. I can imagine Paul turning and saying, excuse me, I said God. We ought to give thanks to God. I, I, I'm not talking about some genie. I'm talking about God. I'm talking about ultimate reality. God. I'm talking about eternal holiness. God. I'm talking about infinite glory. God. I'm talking about majesty, power, and authority forevermore. God. The creator and sustainer of life, of breath, of you and me. I'm talking about God. Why do some atheists ask this sort of question? Why do some atheists bother to be troubled by the fact that God gets all the credit for good, but none of the credit for bad? You might as well ask back, turn around and say back to them, why does suffering and pain seem like a problem to you? It's because we have this idea that God is good. So if we had all thought that God was bad, that God was not good, then nobody would have a real problem with pain and suffering and think it's a problem for, the for theism, for believing in a God. If, the if we just said, thought that God is not good, theism wouldn't bother anybody. Atheists would have no axe to grind. That idea that God is good, and that's the problem. That idea, the assumption that's in the human heart, that God is good. Sometimes that's only there as a whisper because it's been smothered and it's been ignored and it's been trampled for so many years. But sometimes that whisper grows to a shout that God is good. If God is good, then suffering and pain seem so out of place. It just seems wrong. It seems like it should not be this way. And maybe then some atheists think that all is wrong, that it is wrong with the world. Everything that's gone wrong with the world that we live in means there is no good God. But they have it backwards, my friends. If there was no God, when we get a terrible diagnosis like cancer, when we get some terrible news that we are dying, then we ought to do what Dogs do when they get sick and when they're dying, they go find a, a, a quiet place by themselves to lie down and just wait for death to come, passively accepting their fate. We don't do that. It's because God is good that we can even imagine a world as good as he is and long for it and hope for it and see that by comparison, this world has gone so wrong. It's because God is good that faith in him and love can grow even in hardship, even in persecution, even in the worst possible soils, the worst possible garden, the place with the least natural sunlight. It's because God is good and he assembles his children and he cares for his children by speaking words of peace and grace to them. And he grows his children, even in hardship. Paul says in verse 3, we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, as is right, because your faith is growing abundantly. That word growing abundantly in the Greek, it means it's super growing. It's like, it's like miraculous 
Holy Spirit super grow added to their faith, and it's just unbelievable in the way it's growing. And your love for each other, Paul says, is abounding or, or intensifying. This is not two things, faith that's growing abundantly and love that's overflowing. This is cause and effect. Faith that is super growing so that love becomes ever more intense and ever more penetrating and ever more real as each person loves one another in the name of Christ. We don't need a larger amount of faith. We don't need more faith. We need faith more often. Tom Schreiner says, Our faith doesn't thrive when we think about how much faith we have. It springs up when we behold our God, when we see Jesus as the one who is crucified and risen for us. What is stronger, we should ask, what is stronger, a mustard seed or a mulberry tree? The mustard seed being a very tiny seed and a mulberry tree being a, a kind of a tree, a plant that has roots that are very hard to get out of the ground. If you saw on Facebook Glenn's battle with a tree in his yard, then maybe you can imagine a mulberry tree with roots that just spread everywhere and it's very difficult to dig up. But Jesus said to his disciples, Jesus said to his disciples, if you even had faith like a mustard seed, then you'd be able to say to this mulberry tree, throw yourself into the ocean. And that's the point that Jesus is making here. We don't need more faith. We just need more faith. We need, more, we need faith more often. Luke chapter 17, verse 5 and 6, the apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. And the Lord said, if you had faith like a grain of a mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted into the sea, and it would obey you. What was so difficult facing the disciples that they said, increase our faith? Why did they think they needed more faith? The reason Jesus gave that illustration is so helpful. Is Luke chapter 17, verses 3 and 4, it says, if your brother sins, rebuke him. If he repents, Forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in the day and turns to you seven more times, repenting, I repent, he says, then you must forgive him. And so the disciples, seeing how hard it is to forgive someone who's hurt us, to forgive someone who's wounded us, and to keep doing it as that brother truly repents each time, to keep on forgiving when it becomes more and more painful, they say, well, Lord, increase our faith. And Jesus says, if you even had tiny faith, it would be enough. I love what Schreiner says. He says, we know it's God's will that we forgive those who sin against us. Yet when we're faced with actually forgiving them, we often struggle because the pain is so severe. Mustard seed faith, then, is faith that kills works of the flesh, Galatians 5, 19-21, and it produces the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5, 22-23. Love, joy, peace, and patience are mountains that can only be climbed by faith. Faith, after all, expresses itself in love, Galatians 5, 6. So Dr. Schreiner says, mustard seed faith believes the gospel will go to the ends of the earth and triumph over the gates of hell. And the clearest evidence of mustard seed faith is whether you love God and your neighbor. Our greatest enemies, Schreiner says, are, are not outside of us, but within. Our greatest foe is the hate and rebellion that overtakes us the mustard seed faith, because it is placed in Jesus Christ, gives us the victory over our sin. That's why in verse 3 in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, Paul says, We ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, as is right, because your faith is growing abundantly, and therefore the love of every one of you for one another is increasing. When these Thessalonians endured more persecution and more affliction, 
and kept trusting even then in Jesus more and more often so that they loved each other when it was hard. And they loved each other when their flesh told them to just serve themselves and protect themselves and take care of number one. And they still loved one another even then, even more intensely. The more difficult it got and the more costly it became, they loved one another even then. And it shone a spotlight on the one their faith is in, on God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Why did Paul say we ought? In verse 3, we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers. Why did Paul say we ought? Because their super-growing faith and their abundant, intense love for each other was exactly what these missionaries had prayed for. Here's the prayer. It's back in 1 Thessalonians, the first letter, chapter 3, verse 12. Here's the prayer, chapter 3, verse 12. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all as we do for you. There's the prayer. Here's the answer. We ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, as is right, because your faith is growing abundantly and the love of every one of you for one another is increasing. If that's the prayer and that's the answer, then who should get the credit? The one who answered their prayer. The one who assembled his church in the first place. Assembled his children. The one who cared for his children still by speaking to them channels of grace and peace in the scriptures. The one who grows his children through their faith in him, even during the most inhospitable and difficult hardships. You don't need bigger faith You don't need more of faith. You don't need a huge pile of faith. You need faith in Jesus more often. You need faith in Jesus that is growing faith, that exercises confidence and exercises trust in the loving kindness and in the grace and the peace that Jesus gives. And you need to believe in him more often, more and more often, when it's hard to forgive your brother or your sister or your neighbor, when it's hard to endure the suffering and the hardship and the affliction, when it's hard to love your enemy. How do you do that? Remember. Remember more often what Jesus has done for you. Remember more often what Christ has given to you. Chew on his word. Eat it and chew on it. (laughs) Maybe if Nathan has ever given you some of his beef jerky, you know what it's like to chew something hard and to suck the good juices and the flavor out of it. Chew on God's word and suck the flavor out of it. Suck those juices right into you and let them nourish you. Let them strengthen you. The word of God leaves the sweetest taste in your mouth and it gives nourishment to your soul. You need to remember more often who God is and what he has done. You need that grace and peace that flows to you through his word. Again, why does this matter? Well, my friends, living things grow. Living potatoes sprout, right? Eventually, if your faith in Jesus and your love for God's children is not growing, if, if you are stagnant in your spiritual life, you should ask whether you yet are one of God's children, whether he yet has assembled you into the assembly of his people under his word. You should ask whether or not Christ is yet your Savior, because he assembles his children under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. He speaks to his children through words of grace and peace in his scriptures. And he does it still today through churches that are gathered under humble, weak preachers who speak the words of God from the Bible. He does it still today and he grows them and he nourishes them and he sustains them by his word. Scripture like this letter that brought life-giving hope to a beaten and afflicted people in Thessalonica. Dead flowers, flowers, 
don't bloom. But God's children do. Now when God upholds you and me through upheaval, through affliction, through hardship, isn't it his credit? Isn't it to him that that we ought to give thanks? It isn't because we are such good Christians. It isn't because we have so much faith. It is because God is our Father and Jesus is Lord. It is because he assembled us as his children. It is because he speaks to us through his word, grace and peace flowing to us. It is because he is making us grow and he is making us trust and he is causing us to love one another. The way that God upholds us through upheaval makes it more and more obvious to us, reassuring us and giving us comfort. And it makes it more obvious to others as a testimony that he is our God and we are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Let's pray. Father, I ask, O Lord, I ask that through such a weak and humble thing as preaching, through such a weak and embarrassing thing in the eyes of the world, as a man standing in front of a pulpit and and speaking to people. But Lord, this isn't any old word that we are speaking. This is your word. This is the word of God. So I ask, Father, that even right now, you would reward our faith in you, well-placed faith in you, with power. And that you would cause the plants of our souls to grow and bear fruit. That you would bring life as we respond to what we hear in your word, as we respond in faith, that you would cause life to well up inside us, eternal life, Lord. That you would cause us Lord, to trust you when our sin would lead us to disobey you, that we would say no to sin and we would trust Jesus and follow you and do your will, that we would turn to one another even when it's easier to protect ourselves and we would love in the name of Christ and seek the good of each other instead of only self-preservation. And we would do it out of honor and glory for Jesus because that is what he has done for us. Oh, Father, that we would be allowed by your Holy Spirit and empowered by your Holy Spirit to look and resemble, to see, to, to be like your children, to be holy because our Heavenly Father is holy, to be your people, Lord, weak, humble, broken, completely imperfect, and yet chosen and loved and assembled and cared for by God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. O oh, Father, would you do a work in us today and in the coming weeks and months and years in Beacon Church that makes it evident because of what becomes visible in our growing faith and intensifying love, would you cause it to become evident that we ought always to give thanks to you, God, for what you have done in us. In the name of Jesus Christ, we ask this.